Hello, carries and crash test dummies. My name is Tavius Guy, and there is a new cinematic teaser out for League of Legends. Which means, of course, it's time for my patented, long-winded animation breakdown videos where I frame by frame my way through everything and just kind of gush over how lovely the craftsmanship on display is. But I did want to talk about something else first, just a little bit. Um, I don't know which animation studio has made this one. Generally, Riot Games like to contract out um, animated trailers and teasers and cinematics like this to outside studios because while they do have an in-house crew of people who can do cinematics it's a lot easier if everyone has some contractors on it and given just how similar the Draven model looks and just given the particular aesthetics and there's no I would imagine that it's Blur Studios once again the same studio who did the 2014 cinematic and New Dawn but like if I'm wrong about that my apologies to the studio that actually made this um, but it's it's pretty much just a, it's my best guess. So something I did want to, to talk about before we get into just gushing over the animation is the presentation of the world that's being delivered to us in this particular version of a League of Legends cinematic teaser because this is why I bring up A New Dawn. If you remember A New Dawn back in the day, that cinematic was like you had five versus five. You had two teams of five champions fighting each other. Because of some reasons, they they were just they were just fighting each other. I don't know who cares. Like it's the Ari and Leona, and Graves were on one team with Rengar, and something. The Darius and Draven were there, and Syra was then jerk and died. Like it was very sort of. They are just kind of fighting, but there's no reason why they're fighting. It's just because that's what League of Legends is. You take five champions into combat and then they fight. This is a very different approach to telling these kinds of stories because here we are getting rather deep lore cuts into the League of Legends universe justifying why these characters are in conflict. Jin, escaped mass murderer, apparently has taken up a bit of residence in Piltover, and Camille does not appreciate this, and given that she's essentially a law enforcement official in that town of a sort, she has come to capture him. Here we have Noxus, where Riven is being forced to f uh, fight in the gladiatorial pits, and Draven, who is, of course, King Gladiator of Noxus, fighting her because he finally feels like he's got a challenge here. And here we have the Noxian invasion, or one of the many Noxian skirmishes in... Ionia, with Irelia and a ragtag group of farmers and, you know, not great soldiers trying to fight them back, getting help from Akali and Kennen, which are, of course, members of, of, of uh, the Kinku Order, and from Karma. So, like, there's a lot of lore. The reason why the characters here are fighting is specifically because of stuff that happens in the League of Legends lore universe. It's specifically about their personalities. It's about who they are as people. It's about what are they defending. There's a good reason why these characters are fighting. There's a narrative there. And it's not just five random people squaring off against five other random people because... Uh, <clears throat> and that to me is a little bit interesting because the history of League of Legends cinematic teasers begins um, with teasers that are more like a new dawn, really. Like, uh, when you think back to teasers like um, Welcome to League of Legends, which was one of the first cinematic teasers, that too, much like a new dawn, just features like two groups of five that are fighting, because, uh, but they're actually fighting on the Summoner's Rift. They're actually doing the thing that you theoretically would be doing in a, League, in a game of League of Legends. They're fighting on Summoner's Rift. There's monsters, there's minions, there's towers, and the champions are completely mismatched and have no discernible, observable reason for fighting each other. And that transitions then into something like Twist of Fate, which comes along, I think, in 2013. Which, again, it's just some champions who are fighting each other because of reasons. Which is, again, it's about selling the idea of League of Legends gameplay rather than the idea of League of Legends lore. Whereas this teaser says, screw the gameplay. We're not even going to hint at what the gameplay of League of Legends is. We're not even going to, going to pretend that the gameplay has anything to do with the lore, we're just going to focus on selling you League of Legends as... I hate using the word for this, but as an IP, as a cinematic universe, as a narrative universe, as a story universe. We're going to sell you the characters, we're going to sell you the aesthetics of their worlds, we're going to sell you their interpersonal conflicts, rather than sell you the idea of, hey, you can hardcore game online platinum challenger thing do with your friends. Like... That's not, never really even implied in this particular teaser. This could be the trailer for a particularly high-concept fantasy movie, for all we know. And that, to me, is quite fascinating. And good lord, do I love this ribbon fight sequence. I look forward to breaking that one down. Anyway, I have a longer-form video planned 
sometime later talking specifically about the history of League of Legends cinematic teasers and how they try to sell us the game. But that was the point I wanted to hit on first is that this cinematic teaser is not about selling you League of Legends the game. It's about selling you League of Legends the world. And let's start with some of the very, from a filmmaking perspective, some of the very clever foreshadowing um, that happens in this one. This first, very first shot where we're looking at Jin hanging out at his creepy piano being a creepy serial killer, you know, like he do. His traps are already laid in the dirt in front of us. Now, we don't get to understand that this is a trap and not just a piece of random de debris scattered among pieces of random debris all over the place until one of Camille's soldiers steps on it later on down the line. But I think it's clever that it's being set up here. And that's something that happens more than once, because if we move forward, here you can see right behind Draven, Riven's sword is already there, ready and waiting for it to be used. Um, when he throws it to Riven later on down the line. This is called setup and payoff. Um, and that's, that's a, it's a thing that, that you can find in a lot of films where something is going to get set up, like something's going to be introduced into the narrative, either it's like hanging on the background or a character mentions a thing, and then a little time is going to pass, and then that thing is going to come back and become relevant. You can also find that principle described as Chekhov's gun sometimes. And um, it, it has a few different applications. Um... In video games, and also notice those familiar looking claws and stuff hanging out on the wall here in the back, and indeed Draven's own axes hanging in the back here. Um <clears throat> And this, this principle um, shows up everywhere in filmmaking. Usually you'll have, in a longer cinematic narrative, you'll have a reminder of the setup that happens in the middle of that. Uh, Foldable Human has a fantastic video on that. I'm going to link to that down in the description, uh, specifically where he talks about, uh, I think, Suicide Squad? Yeah. Um... But that's being employed here. Some things are being set up at the start of the animated short that then get a payoff later on down the line. And that also happens here, because here you can see Irelia releasing this little glowing thing into the sky, right? And it seems like she's just kind of admiring the glowing thing that's floating around. But take a look at what happens later, when she's confronting the Noxian army and Sion knocks her flat on her ass. Let's see if I can find the particular shot. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, it's so much lovelier to try and do this in a Premiere Pro. Now look what happens. As she's put into this, oh, things are looking dire, this is a bad situation. She just got knocked on her ass by a scion, and she's got a bunch of farmers fighting a bunch of soldiers. It's going about as well as you could expect. You see it, right? Right there. The little thing she released into the air has come back. So what she was sending out there, and I don't mean this literally, I mean this is, this is the metaphor that's being established. When she releases that thing into the air... She's sending out a cry for help, essentially. Because she knows she's screwed. She's got farmers, they've got soldiers. It's not really a fair fight. And right here, as this thing returns to her, her call for call for help has been heard. We get, if we cut along to the next shot, help has arrived. Karma has shown up. And when they show up, the, the, the Karma and Akali and Kenan and and the rest of them, look what's following them, the little glowing flowers. So the flowers become this this the symbol of Ionia itself and the symbol of unity. And just from a filmmaking perspective, putting all of that thematic weight into these little glowy things and then having it pay off within the span of three minutes, of which only like sixty seconds really belong to Aurelia. That's just Mm, that's really good filmmaking. That's that's just a really good way to use these little visual signifiers to kind of communicate a story that's there for nerds like me who want to go and really just stare ourselves blind on the thing that's happening in it. Using those little glowing flowers is just such, such a clever little move. So, let's have a look at uh, Jin's little sequence here at the start. There's a very bit of basic filmmaking going on. This, what you're looking at right here, is called a Dutch angle. Uh, I don't know why it's called a Dutch angle, I just know that it is. And usually when you see this particular angle in filmmaking, that means that the camera is twisted somehow from being aligned horizontally. Like, it, it, instead of being aligned in conjunction with gravity, the camera is deliberately taking on a skewed perspective. Now, 
Bad filmmakers will overuse the Dutch angle in order to be, oh, this is this is dramatic and scary, so Dutch angle, bah, because Dutch angles are scary and they make you feel disconcerted and off balance, which is what they're supposed to do. Good filmmakers will use them as a bit of uh, subtle storytelling. And they come up, uh, you can see how the camera's kind of swinging from Dutch angle to Dutch angle. And again, here, as we're looking at Jin, again, we're looking at him with a Dutch, this little slightly twisted ankle, uh, angle uh, on the camera, as though we're looking at someone who is himself twisted. Now, again, a bad filmmaker would go ham on this, like would really try to make ah ha ha, everything is twisted and weird. But here, it's a very subtle bit of camera motion um, that's introduced here at the start. You can see how the camera is kind of rolling along its own axis as it's zooming in on Jin there in distance. And by the way, lovely little bit of use of light in order to frame it. Like the instant this this thing starts, you your eye is drawn here, and it's drawn there by a few things. First of all, there's the line of chairs going down here that, that immediately will sort of naturally draw your eye in this direction. Then there's the line down here, which creates this little mini frame within a frame that again, oh, this is just a bunch of blah, visual nonsense that your eye can't really make out. But here, oh, here's something we can see. And of course, he's also highlighted, literally, by having a light shining on him, which is also a stage light. Um, because Jin is a dramatic asshole who likes to posture and 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 promenade and and be dramatic and be a little bit of a you know a little bit of theater bitch, and so of course he's got a spotlight on him, um, and you, but you can also see how all of the lines that are present in the frame just kind of they tend to converge in this general area, so your eye is constantly being pulled to this spot here, and they also uh, achieve it by having negative space. You see all this space here, right? All of this is just filled with noise. And by noise, I don't mean sound, I mean visual noise. Like this debris on the floor and this all kinds of broken things and there's corpses and blah, 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 detail. But here, you get this open breath of fresh air with a like, little bit of detail in the background, but there's barely anything. And again, so your eye is drawn here because this seems like it's kind of closed off, but this is being framed by all of the chaos, all of the destruction, all of the apparently random mess that's lying around is framing Jin as he stands upon the stage, which again, Jin is the kind of sociopathic mass murderer who likes to think of his sociopathic mass murdering as art, which is framing him as the diva, as the performer at the center of all the attention. And again, it's not, this is not like masterclass storytelling from some cinematic genius whose, you know, ideas have never been parallel. It's just really good basic craft of filmmaking. And I also really like this little detail here that even when we see Jin for the first time, we see his mask, we don't really see him because he's behind this metal arrangement of things. Uh, I think it's a holder for sheet music. That's kind of cutting his face into pieces. That's kind of, that's breaking him a little bit. Now, if you remember the first teaser that we got for Jin and indeed his, um, his, his splash art features Jin in a broken mirror. Like, we're looking at Jin in a broken mirror as a visual symbol of how he's kind of... He's a nutcase. He's crazy. His brain is broken. And so here, again, we're not seeing Jin fully. We're seeing him through a broken perspective. Both the Dutch angle, which persists into the next shot, where you can see we're completely off-kilter from what would, what would be centered at all. Um... And it's constantly, every time Jin is framed, he's framed in a way that puts us a little bit off-center, that puts us a little bit off-kilter, that makes it harder to see. Whereas, contrast that with the fight scene here in the arena, and you pretty much get nothing but proper angles. Like, there's a little bit of Dutch angling going on with Draven here, which again is meant to put off a little bit off-center. And from a visual storytelling perspective, how funny is it that for someone who didn't doesn't know anything about the League of Legends universe, their assumption when seeing this scene is going to be that, oh, Draven is the king. <laughs> He's the king, uh, like Caesar, presiding over the arena. The emperor of whatever this nation is, when in fact the leader of the nation, of course, is Swain. Especially since he's wearing the golden thing around his head that looks like a crown. But of course, he is the king. He's the king of the arena, which is very much who he is in the storytelling of League of Legends. He's the king of the arena. He is the greatest showman in Noxus. He's the guy who most loves fighting these arena fights out of everybody. Also, uh, excuse me there, I had to swallow some spit. Um, also a little bit of lovely storytelling um, that when he's bored, when he's just kind of sitting around not knowing what to do, 
his basic move is to spin something around his finger. Like, that that's part of his personality. He likes things to spin around and swing, which is setting up how, of course, that's exactly how he fights with his axes. And so that's a, that's a good little character detail that, oh, yeah, that carries over into other aspects of his personality. When Draven is hanging out and he doesn't have his axes, he will spin other things around because that's just who he is as a person. It's very good. Just very excellent. Now, from a character design perspective... There's a little bit of Uncanny Valley happening here, with Aurelia especially. Um, those are some awfully big eyes she's got going on there. And I'm, I, like, personally, I'm getting kind of Alita Battle Angel vibes from this particular shot, where she has these really large, bright, clear eyes that... Yeah, this is a stylization choice, and you can kind of hear from how I'm a little bit uncomfortable with it, that I'm not 100% on board with it. Like, it... it I can't... When I look at this shot, I can't decide whether they want us to feel like Irelia is a real person, someone who, like, exists with realistic texturing and realistic lighting effects, and you can see the depth of field that's being applied to her face and, and, the, and the blurring and the sort of semi-realistic... Are we supposed to feel as though she looks like a real person, or are we supposed to feel like she looks like a highly rendered cartoon character? Because I can't... I'm having some trouble deciding. And the big eyes in her face is a big part of the reason why. Because hum humans generally don't have eyes that size. I'm just saying. They, they, they're generally a little smaller than that. And that's a stylization choice. That It's not that it doesn't work, by the way. I'm not criticizing it as, oh, this is a mistake. Just that, for me, seeing that shot... Instead of thinking about what her facial acting is emoting and, and what she's trying to say as a person, I'm immediately thinking about, whoa, hey, hmm, what's going on there? Like, I'm immediately sort of taken out of it a little bit by, by the question there. But that's neither here nor there. The colors are gorgeous in this thing. Now, they're, they're relatively muted. We have seen previously when Ionia has been portrayed um, in, in cinematics from, from Riot, we have seen Ionia often be a very highly saturated place. Like we have lots of saturated colors and flowers and, you know, colorful trees and stuff everywhere to sort of indicate that the place is a magic place where all the plants are full of magic and stuff. They've scaled that back a little bit here so that it looks more like it's just some, you know, farm in a highland somewhere and not... A place at the heart of all magic in Ionia, but I do like how excellently they contrast. You can see all the greens and all the untouched loveliness of Ionia here, and then as you pan up towards the Noxian army, the color palette of where they've been rampaging through takes on a much redder hue. Pink, actually, because it's a, a sunset scene. It's a golden hour, which is the perfect hour to set any battle scene. But you can see that contrast in what is and what will be if the Noxian army has its way. So you set you set up the threat pretty much right away. And then we get a drastic shift of color palette. And by the way, that's something else we should talk about is the use of color palette in um, the shot. We have the scene with Jin and Camille, which is primarily, as you can see, framed in blue. Blue, 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 blue everywhere in the shots. Then we head on over to Noxus, where we've got a lot of reds, because of course that's that's what Noxus is like, but we've also got a lot of dust, we've got a lot of browns, we've got a lot of, you know, um, sand going on, which again, very much fits Noxus's a aesthetic as, as a place of, of harshness, of, of groundedness, and you're like, this is not a place for high ideals, this is a place to be sensible and fight until whoever you're fighting against is dead. And then we shift to Ionia, which despite, like I said, it, they've desaturated it and cut a little bit back on the whole magic thing, but it still very much looks like the kind of place where sorcerers and wizards would live. Like, especially if you take a look at the design of the houses that sometimes literally look like wizard hats. And the color palette here is much more, rather than the, the you know, dusty grays and browns and reds of, of Noxus, you get a lot of greens, you get a lot of sort of... Um, dusty gray for the rock, you get the soft golden light of the afternoon in which the battle is taking place contrasted against those very bright blue lights. So you get these very strongly contrasting color palettes between the various scenes, which is why when suddenly we cut, like from, from, from this moment, we can tell that we're back in Piltover, we're back with Jin, we're back with it where we started the cinematic short because the color palette is back to that exact same series of hues, which again, basic filmmaking, but it's being applied really, really well here. In order to 
And that's how you can do shorts like this, where you can cut from one environment to another environment to another environment without confusing the reader or the audience in this case, just by having a clarity of your color vision, a clarity of this color means here, these colors mean here, and those colors mean there. It, it helps the, the reader stay situated, and I think it works really well. I also do like <laughs> that apparently, apparently Piltover has SWAT teams. <laughs> I don't know, there's something about that that just seems really funny to me that, uh, like, we go from having a trip to, you know, magic not Asia with, you know, farmers defending their village back sometime in the Middle Ages, and then it's like, boom, squad tactics, alpha squad, move in, go, bravo, go, hut, 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 <laughs> the guy's holding up these, I guess they're like harpoon guns, like, they're, they're crossbows, They've got harpoons in them, but they're holding them up like they're shotguns and assault rifles. And it's, and there's just, there was just, the first time I saw it, there was just something about the, the complete disconnect that all of a sudden we're looking at a modern military tactic shooter that just made me laugh. That was really funny, but it's also signaling to us that, hey, the League of Legends universe can contain this and more. Like it has room for not just all the magic nonsense and not just sort of the medieval arena fighting nonsense, but also this kind of stuff, like this kind of aesthetic. I think it's funny to me, but it's also compelling. Like it's also, it's a lot more interesting than a fantasy universe that is just fantasy and nothing else, that we have a fantasy universe with modern military squad tactics. And I'm not gonna lie, if, if Riot Games wants to make like a modern XCOM style squat tactics video game set in Piltover, where like you're leading Camille's elite squad of people to kill terrorists or whatever. I would be into that. I would be into that. Oh, by the way, another bit of good filmmaking as we cut back to... <laughs> I just... <laughs> They've got riot shields. It's just funny. Um... It's not stupid. It's not stupid. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying it's funny to see that contrast explored so, so powerfully. Jin, of course, is still sitting in the spotlight, which again, uh, but the filmmaking I wanted to talk about is that the first shot we get of Riven is her rising up out of the ground. And then before we see Riven herself, really, like she's, she's kind of down there. We can barely see her. We see Draven lean forwards because he already knows, oh, here's, here's the interesting one. So our first impression of Riven isn't an impression of her, it's an impression of what do other people think of her. And that's a really good way to establish immediately who Riven is in this context. She's not just some random prisoner who's being thrown to the lions. No, no, this one, this is the main event. This is the prize fighter. This is who Draven has been waiting for. And if that guy who's sitting up there and who's powerful and who's like the king or something of the thing that's going on, if he's leaning forward and going, oh, now we're getting interested, then we, as an audience, also become interested. And that's a really, really effective way to introduce a character and make them interesting is by having other characters react as though there's something there that you should be interested in. Which would be more interesting than if we just cut up with Riven and we saw her, and we don't know, like, is she strong? Is she, what, what's, what's her deal? No, no, we know immediately that she's powerful. And then she comes up and we've got Imperator Furiosa on deck here. Like, we've got Captain Kickass of, you know, hand you your, you know, open a can of whoopers brigade. I don't know. That was a bad analogy. But like, immediately because of Draven's reaction and then just blatantly ripping off Fury Road with the dark. And the, by the way, the reason why that works is because having that very dark smear across her eyes highlights her eyes even more powerfully. And highlighting the eyes of a character makes them scary. This is why Batman... You would see in the animated series that even when, when everything else is dark, Batman's eyes grow bl b bright and white because, well, he's dangerous badass and his eyes are always there. And so we cut back to most of my criticism, I'll be honest, for this particular short I have for the Irelia scenes for a couple of reasons. First of all, because of the whole Uncanny Valley thing, you can see here Riven's eyes seem substantially smaller than Irelia's. And second of all, because there's just something about how she's animated here. Like, look at that. There's something about the way she's animated that's just really stiff to me. That's not really... Like, I, I, I would look for a lot more elasticity, a lot more fluidity of her motion than what we really get to see here. And though, she, like, she's doing the spinning thing, but you look at... 
her posture here as she breaks through, right? She's like, sort of like barely hunched over and then she arcs her back back into this this very stiff, upright standing pose. And it's like, I really wanted to see like some proper... Like, to, especially given how she's animated in-game. In-game, she's fluid as hell. Like, she's just, she's flowing like water through everything. But here, take a look at the way she's running. Uh, what am I doing? Oh, clicked the wrong hotkey there. Take a look at the way she's running. Like, this is a very stiff, like, she, she's vaulting over soldiers by stepping on one of their shields, right? And yet, the way she's running is this very sort of stiff, controlled upright. And if that was sort of supposed to be a symbol of her control as a character, that she's sort of tough and unyielding, sure. But the animation style that is displayed with her in-game, and indeed the animation style that, that that's implied by her lore, is that she's extremely fluid, that she's a dancer, that she's someone who is constantly flexible, constantly in motion. And I don't know, there's, there's something about... Riven. Did I call her Riven? Irelia. Something about Irelia's animation in this particular short just disappointed me a little bit. She seems just a little bit too stiff, a little bit too plastic, a little bit too uncompelling as a thing in motion. As, especially compared, like, especially when you compare her to what Riven is about to do to these gladiators. Like, because Riven is not about at all plasticity or being smooth or being in motion. Riven is all like, brutal efficiency. Riven is all about, like, it's not even, we're not gonna flow around their attack, we're just gonna grab your thing and break it over your head. Like, there's no subtlety, there's no kung fu, there's no martial arts here. It's just a lady beating the crap out of a bunch of guys because she's extremely good at beating the crap out of people. That I think just works so well. My only criticism of the Riven fight is that I wish they didn't do this. I wish they would cut less. And I especially wish they wouldn't cut back to Draven again. We have already seen Draven's reaction to Riven. We already understand that he's interested in her, which means she's probably a badass. This right here, remember what I talked about with setups um, and payoffs and reminders? This right here is the reminder. They're setting up that Draven is interested in her in the first shot when he leans forward and she comes out of the ground. Now they're reminding us that he's interested in her when he leans forward again midway through her fight, which interrupts the flow of the fight and kind of annoys me on a personal level. But that's just me, because I really like long takes of fight scenes that are well chore choreographed and just kind of... And then that reminder eventually leads into a payoff when we see Draven... Let's see. Uh, here. Throw the weapon down, and then he jumps down, and then they have the fight. Like, that's the payoff of Draven showing interest and showing interest and showing interest, is that he throws her weapon to her, because he wants to fight her at maximum power, like he's a super saiyan or something. Also, good visual symbology is that Riven uh, takes her own chain, like the chain that binds her to that binds her to the fight, the chain thing that's supposed to trap her and take away her power, and she uses it to strangle a guy. She uses the thing that they have uh, have captured her with as a means to beat up the people who captured her, and then she does a mic drop in front of Draven, which is just such a good thing. And by the way, look at the muscle rendering on this lady. I mean, come on. This is something that I've seen a lot of 3D animation projects struggle with, is how to render a, a, physi a, a physiology and and um, and an anatomy that is feminine, but which is also clearly physically powerful. And a lot of the times, 3D animation tends to default towards making them look feminine and just have them do stuff that clearly requires a lot of physical strength and just go just assume that she's really strong underneath without doing the work of. Like, putting in the time, rendering the muscles, rendering the sweat, rendering sort of the, the the signifiers of power, because they are seen as more masculine. As though, like, and and people tend to be afraid that, oh, if we have, give them too much muscle mass and stuff like that, then they're not going to be appealing. And that's one of the issues I kind of have with Irelia a little bit, is that the lady is supposed to be this tremendously powerful martial arts dancer, but if you look at her arms, like, they're thin as sticks. Like, this tiny... Like, this looks like she could barely lift a carton of milk, honestly. Where I've seen professional dan like I've studied a lot of anatomy. I've got anatomy reference books and stuff like that, and I've seen professional dancers and professional like um, athlete, like uh, people who are gymnasts who who are not really doing like weightlifting and stuff like that, but who are still doing a lot of agility stuff and like archers and stuff. And they tend to have more muscle than that, 
in order to do the physically strenuous things that they do. And it, that's another thing that kind of annoys me a little bit about, about Aurelia's presentation here is that she very much defaults to femininity without really in, in, imparting that martial power. And where I think Riven strikes a much better balance where she's still a, a gorgeous looking hot lady, which is a thing that's perfectly fine to have as part of a character design, but her character design and her physiology, her anatomy still implies she's a gorgeous lady who leads a life where she spends a lot of her time beating people up and fighting. Which is something that's kind of missing from, I'm uh, kind of missing from Aurelia. Uh, but that's, that's neither here, that's a problem with Aurelia's character design in general. That's not really a par problem with the animated short. The animated short is just kind of being faithful to the character design. I really like this shot a lot. I really do. Like, just because it's such a badass move to like, your chain doesn't matter. You have not captured me. I am not trapped. I'm not trapped in here with you. You're trapped in here with me. Like, it's it's a really good badass move. Let's see. Yeah, there we go. Now, here's something that's, that's well done, um, but it's really just... You see how, as the sword is flying towards her... It's be it's highlighted by just the metal reflecting. Look how that's framed in the shot. Like you have the dark shadows of Draven's little pavilion thing, and then you have this bright piece of metal shining up against it. If they had framed this differently, if they had framed it like against the bright sky or against something that that was bright and glowing and metallic as well, the sword would be really hard to see. But because they framed it against this little letter box of darkness it becomes a lot easier to see what's going on with it. Here's another glory shot, by the way. Did I mention glory shots yet? No, I don't. I don't think I did. This is a glory shot. A glory shot is this kind of tableau where you pull the camera out and you see a scene happen in slow motion so that you can really take in all the detail and all the gorgeousness with minimum motion blur to stop things being interesting. And it's supposed, essentially, these are wallpapers. These are wallpaper moments in the short. And a few more of those are gonna be coming up. And by the way, uh, this is a glory shot too, of Riven holding up her chain, showing it off. This is a glory shot. And the glory shots that are most important to the short come in by the end. Let me see if I can find one. First one, I think, is... It's Camille as she descends on Jin here. This is a glory shot. You can see it, like, everything slows down. All the detail becomes incredibly clear. And the characters are almost frozen in place in the kind of epic posing that you would want in order to make the scene have maximum impact. Glory shot. And then we have this. Glory shot. Again, characters frozen in place during the moments of maximum impact to create a, a beautiful tableau, sort of implying... And this is something, by the way, uh, this is the kind of thing that uh, the Matrix made famous back in the day. Like, that was the whole point of the bullet time rotating camera thing, was to create these shots, these glory shots, these high-impact, maximum power moments in a film. And when you go to watch a Michael Bay movie, and you, by the end of the movie, you find that you are completely fucking exhausted for some, like you're completely just, you cannot, uh, oh my God, nothing in that film was interesting. Nothing was very good. It's because every single shot in a Michael Bay movie, pretty much, is this. It's a glory shot. Every single shot is telling you, look at me, look at me, look at me. I'm full of cool stuff that's happening, big explosions and, and like cool camera angles and slow motion. Argh! And that's, that's why Michael Bay movies feel so exhausting is because they're composed of nothing but this. And this animated short is a good example of how to handle a, girl, a glory shot properly because they're used as bookends. They're used as, as epic moments within, in a, within the individual narratives that are going on, and they're used as bookends to end the individual narratives and showcase what's going to be going on. Here comes another glory shot, and this one is, is uh, in fact, directly lifted. Um, let's see if we can find one where Kenan isn't blocking the view. Hey, Kenan, how you doing? We don't get to see you much. I wish we get to see you more. This right here is literally that particular... You know the shot from the um, Avengers Infinity War trailer where the heroes are running in, uh, with the Wakandan army and the Hulk and everybody's kind of running towards the camera? It's that shot. It's that exact shot. It's a trailer shot. And it's bookending the whole... Um, it really is whole storyline about standing alone and being outmatched. But, oh, hey, I've got allies now. I'm not outmatched anymore. Now we're fighting on equal footing. Here comes the real fight. That kind of thing. See, um, here's another glory shot. 
it's not it's not a particularly pronounced one, but it's still Irelia gets a few because what's important for her storyline is that we are properly sold on the idea that she's in trouble, that she cannot handle it alone, that there is tension, that there is jeopardy, which there really never is with, for instance, Riven. Like Riven is never really in jeopardy um, against against Draven. Riven is is like she she's in control of the scene from the start. Like she's never really in trouble. We know that because she beat up like nine guys while chained to a rock. So she's perfectly fine. We don't really need a bunch of shots setting up tension moments like that for her. The same thing goes for uh, Jin and Camille, where Camille walks in. She's got a whole army on her side, and Jin is got a whole bunch of traps hanging around everywhere in the theater. They're on equal footing, and that's important for the tension of their scene. Is that they, these are combatants on equal footing facing off against each other, but with uh, Irelia, the important thing is that she's on extremely unequal footing with her opponent, and the catharsis, the emotional res resolution of the story comes when she finally has allies. And by the way, have you noticed how incredibly long Camille's neck is? Like, lady! How many vertebrae do you have in your spine? I'm just saying. Good lord, that's a lot. You Very long. That, of course, is, again, a character design, a piece of intentional character design, because Camille is all about this tall, long, sharp, almost predatory, predatory bird-like demeanor that she's got going on. She's all about that, and so they've lengthened her neck and make, made her even pointier <laughs> than I think she is even in-game. And it just looks, it, I mean, it looks hilarious when you pause on it, but in motion it works. And contrast that, by the way, with, with the anatomy that they've given Riven, where, um, again, Irelia is also kind of a little bit more in the, in the Camille range, where she's very much about having these very long, thin limbs <clears throat> thing that's going on with her, which I've criticized so much because it's not something I particularly like, but I can see what they're going for. Whereas Riven, if you take a look at her, <clears throat> her anatomy is much more... Um, it's much more thick, uh, which I don't... Not T-H-I-C-C, -C, but thick in the sense of actually being... Um, being powerful and much more squat and, uh, and ha she has a lot more gravity to her than the other characters because she's more physically powerful. And it's just, it's just generally real I just really love this fight scene. I really, 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 I really wish they didn't cut back to Draven. I really wish they didn't cut back to Draven. I really wish they just extended the fight scene she has with the gladiators for like... 10 more seconds and gave us like a proper like the raid style extended no cuts one take fight scene because oof that right because it was just such it was just such good fight animation honestly um especially the way that she throws her gravity around and I could nerd out about this for 10 hours so I'm gonna try and limit myself but take a look at like because Riven barely moves here, right? You see how she barely shifts her position. She, like, she barely moves as a person at all from where she is. She just kind of grabs the guy and slams him into the thing. And then, coming around, she just pivots on one foot in order to take on the two other guys. She does, she does so little footwork. She does so little movement. She barely moves from her position at all while fighting th these first three guys. And it's just, it's just so good, honestly. And even here, like when she has a thing thrown at her, she doesn't really move much. She always lets them come to her and then she just kicks their ass in her zone. Which is just... It makes her look like such a badass because she barely she barely has to move while they're flailing around and there are weapons everywhere and stuff like that. She's just kind of... Pow! Bang! Killed you! Killed you! Killed you! I win. Ooh! Just from an acting perspective, that's just really good. That she doesn't do anything excessive, like she's not flailing around or spinning her legs and doing, she's like, it's just, they come close to me and then I kick their ass. So good. Anyway, I think I've said probably about all I really had to say um, about this animated short outside of, of, of a broader perspective. I do want to return to the Camille a little bit more, because this is a really good shot as well. You can see again, all the lines in the shot, like the rows, uh, the, the, the passages between the rows of chairs lead our eye into this frame within the frame where Jin is still highlighted by, um, by the spotlight, which again tells us that not only is he in the spotlight, not only is he the focus of attention, he's also in control. Everything that happens in here is, it's, is it emanating from it. Like the other way of seeing it, everything leads back to him, but also everything emanates from him. The scene is controlled by him. He is the sun at the center of the proceedings. And you can also see 
I don't know if that's what it specifically is, but at the end of the fight with Camille, or at the glory shot with Camille where things are exploding behind her, you see that little purple glow up there? I think he that's where he set up the color bombs or whatever the heck they were in order to set up that shot because I think the, the, the storytelling that's being made here is that the whole thing, Jin setting this thing up, getting Camille to go there, setting up all of the traps to make sure to trap her soldiers, everything he did was specifically because he wanted to get, and the reason why he's shooting at her but not hitting her, which is what, like, that's the thing is, like, he's a sharpshooter, but as she approaches him, he doesn't really, he's not really aiming for her at all. He shoots one of her soldiers, he shoots another one that, that blows up, and he forces her to go up high, where he has planted these bombs that then eventually result in, and we're also going to talk about that Yasuo shot, actually. I'm not actually, I haven't actually run out of things to say about her, where he's making sure that the explosions are going off just in the right place, in just the right framing. so that he can get, and you can see it here, as his eyes light up with appreciation of the scene that he has created, making sure that the explosions happen the exact same, uh, the exact right time. He's setting it up like fireworks, like it's, it's stagecraft. He's, he's essentially taking a bow because look how gorgeous all of this is. I am an artist. I have created this beautiful tableau. He ends the animated, the animated sequence by bowing to us and saying, aren't you glad I showed you this beautiful picture of Camille about to cut me in half with her legs? Right? It's, ooh, from a storytelling perspective, it's just really good. Oh, and speaking of, you remember how I talked about how Riven doesn't really do a lot of movement at all when she's kicking the ass of the other guys that she's fighting? Well, she does a lot of movement when it comes to Draven. With him... She actually does move around. She actually does do footwork. She's actually having to strain herself. She's actually having to work in order to try and deal with him because he is more powerful than those guys, which again, storytelling happening th through the character that this guy, she can't just stand still and kick his ass passively. She has to actually kick his ass. And also, if I'm not much mistaken, actually... Let me see if I can find the particular shot I'm thinking of. I, I thought I had a bunch of stuff to say, and I'd kind of just run out of stuff to say, but I actually missed this. That Draven throws the sword and breaks her chain. Which is such a good detail. Again, because the, the narrative for him is, I want to fight her at full capacity. I want to fight her at full power. I don't want a, a half fight. I don't want a cheat fight. I want to win this because I'm the king of the combat arena, and I love fighting. And you can see Riven realizing it like, this guy is an idiot. Why would he go close combat with me? Why would he go toe to toe? Why would he give me my sword? Why would he break my chain? I'm going to kick his entire ass. And Draven's reaction to that is, yeah, you are. Come on. Which again, from a character perspective, is good storytelling because Draven is primarily really bored for much of that. He, he doesn't care about the fights happening. Uh, boring. Not interested. Uh, uh, uh. I don't care. Like, he, he's completely checked out. He doesn't care about what's going on. The only time he comes alive, the only time he starts to have a facial expression ever of any kind is when he's in the arena, when he's in the dust and dirt, when he's down from his position of power. Which, again, from a storytelling perspective of trying to tell us who Draven is as a person, it's just very effective. Like, it's just very well put together. I also like Akali's little check-in. Like, when, when she comes running, right, she's like, Hey, you okay there? And then she moves on to start kicking Scion's ass. Let's have a look at that sh Scion shot, because... Yeah, that's really good camera movement, actually. But yeah, it's the Yasuo shot that I really wanted to talk about. Because <laughs> this is some Dynasty Warriors nonsense. Everybody else is fighting like, oh yeah, we, we're strong, but we're not super powered or anything like that. And then Yasuo comes in like, no, this is an anime now. <laughs> Which is just it's, it's a lovely bit of showing off, honestly. And I do like, I because I, I was wondering when I was, was watching this shot, whether what Riot have been doing a lot in their animated shorts um, is using 2D and 3D effects together. And what I was wondering 
many times when I saw the shot of, of Yasuo's tornado was whether they had done the same thing with this particular spell effect. But no, it looks to me like everything here is rendered as 3D objects in a 3D scene. But what I quite like is... You see how when they fly out here, there's flying soldiers just pretty much everywhere. But there's this little hole right here, just this little opening, this little eye of the storm. And that's where Yasuo is hanging out as everything else. <laughs> this goes all Dynasty Warriors. Like, this is so Dynasty Warriors. Like, it's it's incredibly Dynasty Warriors. Everything else was like grounded. Oh, it's just farmers fighting against the overwhelming power of the enemy. And this lady who's got like magic swords, but she's not like... She can't handle entire armies on her own, and she's over. She's outnumbered, and she's overmatched. And then Yasuo and and Cannon come in, and it's just like, nah, you know what? Screw that stuff. We can do magic. Boom. <laughs> oh, the cuts, the cuts in this thing. I'm never, I'm never ever gonna be done talking about this. It's been 45 minutes. I should really wrap this up. But let's talk about the cuts um, for a second, cause. You see how here we got a cut um, with continuum of uh, continuum of, of movement um, and continuum of movement, especially affinity of continuum of movement. And this is some complicated film terminology that I'm not 100% up on. But essentially what it means is when you make a cut from one shot to another where the motion in the shot remains the same. And you can kind of see we're going from left to right, kind of rotating around uh, Jin here. And as we move in, we're still rotating around a central point, going from left to right as we, you know, gaze into the arena. And so you get these this sh transition of shots that feels very natural, that doesn't feel too jarring, and kind of leads you gently almost into the next thing that's happening. Which is which is something you can contrast a lot with the shot with the cut that comes right after, where it's Draven just kind of sitting there, and then we cut to something that is completely opposite. Like, where there's no affinity between these two things. Affinity means likeness. Like, there's no likeness between these two shots. The only thing that's like is the positioning of where the eye is at. The human brain naturally is drawn to faces. So when we see Draven sitting here, the first thing that our brain is going to locate is his face. We're going to make sure we know where the face is, what's his exp expression like, like, because that's just the social programming that human brains have, that we look for faces, we want to look at expressions. Which means when we have the cut here to um, Irelia's hand, you can see our attention is gonna be up here on Draven's face. And oh, hey, look at that. Our attention is in exactly the kind of position that it needs to be in, in order to see Irelia open up her hand and send out the little glowing thing there. So despite the cut being very jarring and very sudden, the filmmakers have made sure that our attention is at least somewhere in the right area so that we don't have to... Imagine if, if uh, Aurelia's hand was, like, over here in the shot, and you were looking here, and then we cut to the next shot, and it's like, oh, wait, hey, what the hell happened? And you get disoriented. And so that's, that's something that's really difficult, again, to manage with cuts like that, because if you have too much affinity between cuts, then you run the risk of... Um, of uh, having the audience be confused about the ge geography of what you're trying to show. That is, if there's too much affinity between the individual shots of, of what's going on, you can get a situation where, hang on, did we change locations or is this still the same location? Where you have to, where's, which is where the color palette stuff we talked about earlier comes in. That helps center you, oh, this is a different location. And take a look at, at the contrast between these two very sort of nicely flowing shots and very nicely flowing cuts with what happens here. Right? All of a sudden, there's just pfft, a door. The door is here. And then it gets kicked open and like steam comes billowing out and people are running into the frame. And the reason for that is because here they want you to be confused. They want you to be shocked. They want you to be overwhelmed by what's happening because Camille is entering the scene with overwhelming military force. And then the blue color palette helps place us back in Jin's universe. It helps place us back in where... In, in that particular place, but first it overwhelms us. First it all of a sudden a dude kicks a door open and we've got military tactics. And then there's this cut, which I'm a little curious about, because I've been wondering about it for a while, and it seems to me a little bit like the dude in front who we're probably going to be looking at 
You can see how he does a rotational motion with his sword, or with his, uh, with his... What the hell is it? It's not a shotgun, but his crossbow, I guess? And then we cut to Riven sort of slowly emerging out of the ground. This is a very lack of... There's very little affinity between these two shots. And yet somehow it doesn't feel too jarring, and I can't actually discern exactly why. Someone who knows more about film theory than me would probably be able to suss that one out, but... Here's a really good one. You can see what happens here is Riven taking in the scene, la da da and then she moves forward. And then we cut to Irelia. And again, notice how our attention is going to be somewhere around here. And that's also where Irelia is when we cut to the next scene. And then Irelia is continuing Riven's motion. Riven's motion of moving forward is being continued by Irelia into the next shot, which again, quite nicely done, honestly. That's just a cut on move. And then here. See? <laughs> See how it creates a continuum? Here we have Scion bursting through you know, the ranks of allied soldiers running towards us. And then we cut to an enemy soldier running towards Riven, which creates a connection between the idea of an, like this, this antagonist and this antagonist running towards Riven. So you're creating a, you're reinforcing a connection between Riven and Aurelia as being marginally on the same side, or rather as in they are the protagonists who you're supposed to be rooting for, whereas the other dudes, you're not supposed to be rooting for them at all because they're the bad guys. And then there's the next cut, which happens, I think... Isn't that not until after? Yeah. Because here again, you can see them doing it where we're we're following the perspective of the sword flying towards Aurelia, right? And zooming in on her. And then you can see we continue that camera movement into the next shot, which again, our attention is going to be here, looking at Riven. Oh, hey, look who's kind of in that same spot of attention. It's Aurelia. And look how the camera is continuing that same forwards motion from the sword flying towards Riven into Scion charging towards Aurelia. So you get this affinity between the shots that makes them flow naturally and doesn't really, it, it, it kind of keeps the pace of the action going in a good way, I think. Let's see. Let's see if we can find, because there was one shot in particular I really wanted to. It wasn't this one. It was... Not that one either. It was this one. No, it wasn't. Damn it. Where the hell is it? Was I just imagining it? Am I just thinking of, like, entirely the wrong thing? Yeah, no. But uh, here's a clever one, uh, actually. When you see Kenan detonating his electrical explosion here at the end, you can see, as we cut to Draven, he's almost kind of like he's... Whoa! Like, he's acting almost as though he's reacting to the explosion that happened in the previous shot. Although that's, of course, happening thousands of miles away, but you get that little continuum in the same way that Riven, uh, Irelia was continuing Riven's forward motion. He's kind of reacting to something that's not even happening near him. It works really well. Anyway, I think I've, I've gone on for quite long enough, and I'm going to stop this video before I think of even more things to say. Uh, now that we're like, what, an hour in or something? Okay, only 53 minutes. Well, that's nothing. I could go on for another 40 minutes. Nobody would mind. Anyway, my name has been TB Scott. I'm going to cut this right here. If you've enjoyed this video, then you have a lot of patience. Uh, there's a like button down below you can click on if you are so inclined. If you want to support the channel and the work that I do on the channel, well, uh, you can head on over to Patreon where you can support the channel with what, like if you have a dollar a month and you don't mind me having that, then I could use it to buy things like clothes and also pay rent, which is very good. If you don't want to do the recurring donation thing, of course, that's completely okay. I do have a coffee, which is a service where you can donate in increments of $3 at a time. It's like a one time, if you just want to give me a tip, then you can head on over there and do that. If you don't want to do either of those things, of course, that's completely okay. I'm just happy that you have watched the video so far. <coughs> You can also subscribe to the channel. You can also comment down below telling me to make these videos shorter because holy my God, how are you talking for this long about a three minute animated short? But still, uh, if you haven't enjoyed this video, I don't, what, how, this video is 55 minutes long. How are you still here? But nonetheless, if you want to exp express your displeasure, then you can 
you know, go through the doors and enter the fighting pits. And in the fighting pits, you will face a series of opponents of escalating difficulty until you get to the end where you can fight the dislike button. And if you manage to land a hit on his face, well, he will allow you to add one dislike to the counter on this video. Thank you very much for watching.